The True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival will be held on August 25th through the 27th, 2023 in Austin, Texas. Join other ethical true crime podcasters, victim advocates, and paranormal creators for a weekend full of panels, roundtables, and live shows. Purchase your early bird tickets now at truecrimepodcastfestival.com slash tickets. If you're in the DFW area on September 22nd, 2022 and September 23rd, 2022, I'll be joined by my dear friends Eric from True Consequences and Whitney and Melissa from Colts, Crimes, and Cabernet for True Crime Live. Click on the link in our show notes to buy your tickets. Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to True Crime Cases with Lainey. We may have a new name, but we'll still be bringing you the same quality of podcast and the same high level of respect for the victims of true crime, as always. Okay, enough of the business. Back to the show. Solving a murder is always difficult, but in the 18th century, solving a murder was tremendously hard. In the absence of crime databases, DNA analysis, fingerprint identification, and many other forensic tools yet to be invented, 18th century investigators had their work cut out for them. This was especially true in murder cases where the victim's body was never found. These are called bodiless murders or no-body cases. In the past, no-body cases made it nearly impossible to convict anyone of murder, and for good reason. Throughout history, the punishment for murder has been severe. Usually, the murderer is sentenced to lifelong imprisonment or death, both impactful experiences to say the least. Without the victim's body, it was difficult to justify convicting the person accused of murder. What if the victim wasn't dead? What if the victim actually reappeared alive and well after their accused murderer had been imprisoned, or worse, after they were executed? These were the fears of law enforcement and judges in the 18th century, and those fears were valid. That exact scenario where the victim came back to life happened at least two times. In one recorded example of this phenomenon, a man was found guilty of killing his niece who had disappeared. Witnesses reported that on a previous occasion, they heard the niece begging her uncle not to kill her. When the judge asked the uncle to bring his niece to court to show that he hadn't murdered her, the uncle tried to pass off a different woman as his niece. According to the court, this proved his guilt. The uncle was convicted and executed. However, when the murdered niece turned old enough to claim her inheritance from the uncle's will, she returned in person to receive her compensation. Another time a murder victim reappeared, one man was executed for kidnapping and murdering a second man. It was proposed in court that the apparent murderer had burned the victim's body to ashes in an oven, which is why there was no body. However, the victim returned one year after his alleged murderer's execution. Lord Matthew Hale, an English legal expert of the 18th century, referenced both of these cases in his renowned book, Pleas of the Crown, published in 1736. Lord Hale's legal text would heavily influence English and American law for centuries to come. Lord Hale explained these two cases where the victims returned alive in support of the following statement. I would never convict any person of murder or manslaughter unless the fact were proved to be done or at least the body found. Basically, Lord Hale believed that unless there was overwhelming circumstantial evidence that a crime was convicted, a body was necessary to convict a murderer. But of course, overwhelming circumstantial evidence is hard to get. This is troubling because it can reward a murderer who is especially good at disposing of their victims' bodies. Also, it encourages murder in situations where it might be easier to destroy the body, like on a boat at sea. In the 1900s, some states had versions of no-body, no-crime laws, inspired by interpretations of Lord Hale's writings. These states were trying to avoid accidentally convicting an innocent person of murder, but they may have inadvertently left a few murderers unprosecuted. While solving no-body cases continues to be challenging, 21st century courts have evolved to handle them better than their 18th century counterparts. Now, 
modern courts need corpus delecti to convict a murderer of a crime. While corpus delecti is Latin for the body of the crime, it doesn't mean that a murder case must have a body. Instead, it is the principle that there must be significant evidence that a crime occurred before someone can be convicted. That evidence can come from a victim's body, but it also can come from a combination of forensic evidence, witness accounts, and the accused's confession. According to Thomas Tad DeBias, a federal homicide prosecutor and author of the book No Body Homicide Cases, there have been an estimated 500 trials for no-body cases in the United States as of 2020. Of those 500 trials, approximately 40 cases have been solved in 15 states. On September 19, 2005, the state of Georgia solved their first no-body case when they convicted the murderer of 19-year-old Shannon Melendi. Okay, on to the show. Shannon Denise Melendi was born on October 20, 1974. Her parents were Louise and Yvonne Melendi. Thirteen years before Shannon's birth in 1961, Louise and his parents had fled communist Cuba for the United States, where Louise met his future wife, Yvonne. They married in 1970. In 1975, one year after Shannon's birth, Louise and Yvonne had another daughter named Monique. During this time, Louise opened a portrait studio and became an award-winning photographer. Yvonne was a secretary at a Miami bank. The Melendi family was successful, happy, and looked forward to the future. Shannon was a brilliant and hard-working young woman. Yvonne, Shannon's mother, would later describe her as such a goal-oriented child. At Southwest Miami Senior High School, Shannon was involved in a variety of activities, she was her junior and senior year class president. She played soccer as a legal legal member of the National Forensic League and captain of her debate team for three years. Shannon was well known as a dynamic public speaker. In fact, Shannon spoke before the United Nations and the U.S. Congress. In 1992, Shannon's school nominated her for a Silver Knight Award in the speech category to recognize her excellence in academics and prowess as a public speaker. Shannon's high school political science teacher and soccer coach, Angel Menendez, said, In a way, Shannon's high school years were a preview of what was to come in her adult life. Standing in Congress as a student representative, addressing the student delegates in the General Assembly Hall of the United Nations, or arguing her case as a student attorney at the Dade County Mock Trials Competition, all were unique previews of what life lay in store for her but her dreams were instantly and irretrievably halted. Dreams not based on fanciful thought or unrealistic expectations, but in fact, the logical conclusion of a lifetime of preparation. After graduating high school cum laude in the National Honor Society, Shannon accepted a scholarship to Atlanta, Georgia's Emory University, one of the most prestigious universities in the nation. Georgetown and American University, both esteemed institutions, also accepted Shannon. Ultimately, Shannon chose to attend Emory for the sizable scholarship they offered her. Shannon planned to study pre-law and then join the Navy. Then, she would attend law school and become a Navy Judge Advocate General's Corps, or JAG, attorney. It was Shannon's dream to serve as a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. During her first year at Emory, Shannon became the first ever freshman to win a paid internship with former President Jimmy Carter's nonprofit organization named the Carter Center. Shannon worked 15 hours a week doing clerical work for the organization's conferences and events. While it's unclear if she worked closely with President Jimmy Carter, there is a photograph of the two posed and smiling together. President Carter signed the photo, Best Wishes to Shannon Melendi, signed Jimmy Carter. When she disappeared, Shannon was a sophomore at Emory. At 19 years old, her life was going mostly according to plan. Her favorite song was Forever Young by Alphaville. She made friends at college. She'd enjoyed exciting opportunities because of her intellect and determination. Shannon's budget was tight, but she worked one to two days a week at the pro shop in the softball country club sportsplex on North Decatur Road in Atlanta. 
Shannon's boss, Bert Blackburn, told the Atlanta Constitution that Shannon was a reliable worker. He said, she always showed up on time or early, and she was very cheerful and outgoing. Typically, Shannon worked at the club on Sundays and every other Thursday. In late March of 1994, Shannon asked her boss if she could work on Saturday the 26th instead of Sunday the 27th. She had a soccer game, so her boss allowed the switch. He had Shannon work as a scorekeeper for a softball game, rather than her typical role in the pro shop. On Saturday, March 26, 1994, Shannon worked her shift as the scorekeeper. There were approximately 1,000 people at the club that day. At about 12.45 p.m., she took her lunch break. She should have returned to scorekeep for the 1.15 p.m. game, but Shannon was never seen again. When Shannon still hadn't arrived home on Sunday morning, Athena panicked. She and some friends began looking for Shannon, starting at the club, which was five minutes from campus. On their way to the club, they missed the entrance to the parking lot and had to turn around. Turning around, they noticed Shannon's car, a black Nissan, parked at the gas station near the club. It was parked crookedly at the far end of the gas station. When they checked the car, it was unlocked with a key still in the ignition. According to those who knew Shannon, she was proud of her car and took excellent care of it. She would never have abandoned it at a gas station or left the keys in the ignition. At this point, Athena called the DeKalb County Police Department. She explained Shannon had been missing for 24 hours. Police spoke to a woman working at the gas station where Shannon's car was found. The employee said that the day Shannon had gone missing, she saw Shannon. Later, that same employee would change their story multiple times. By the end, the gas station employee could no longer recall if Shannon had ever been to her store. ABC reporter Rad Berkey spoke to the employee and found the employee's behavior and demeanor most unusual. The police quickly released Shannon's abandoned car to Athena. They hadn't even looked for evidence in the car, which completely shocked Athena. Athena had called Shannon's parents and told them Shannon was gone. Yvonne and Luis immediately flew to Atlanta and reported their daughter missing to the DeKalb County Police. Following their report, 50 to 60 police officers scoured several miles around the club. They searched creek beds and abandoned houses, buildings, and apartments, but found nothing. Since the officers couldn't identify any evidence of foul play, they explained to Shannon's parents that she had probably run off to Cancun on a whim. One officer said, she'll turn up. Only two weeks ago, Shannon had spent her spring break vacation in Florida at Daytona Beach and Pensacola. Upon arriving home, Shannon called her mom to rave about the great tan she'd gotten. Later, the prosecuting lawyers would argue that Shannon's behaviors clearly warrant of an unhappy woman preparing to run away. Despite the DeKalb County Police's fruitless investigation, the initial community support for Shannon's disappearance was impressive. With the help of the police, Shannon's friends and family collected $10,000 for a reward. They put up 60 billboards and 10,000 posters, all with a picture of Shannon, an explanation that she was missing, and a reminder of the $10,000 reward. Shannon's family reached out to President Jimmy Carter and Florida Senator Bob Graham. As a result, the FBI was involved within 48 hours. Former President Carter and his wife Rosalind also released a statement offering prayers for Shannon and her family, as well as a general request for any person with information regarding Shannon's case to come forward. Shannon's father, Luis, contacted Cuban-born actor Andy Garcia, as well as professional football and baseball player Bo Jackson for help. Both Garcia and Jackson recorded PSAs asking the public for assistance in finding Shannon. On Sunday, March 27, 1994, the day Shannon was reported missing, police recovered the body of a young woman. She had been wrapped with rope, weighted with two boat anchors, and left in the Oconee River near Athens, which is about 70 miles northeast of Atlanta. On March 30th, the police told the public that they were 99% certain the body was that of 19-year-old Claudette Fisick, not Shannon. Claudette and Shannon looked somewhat alike since they were both 19 years old, had a slender body type, and had dark hair. 
Claudette was a student at Southern Tech in Marietta, Georgia, which was 20 miles northwest of Atlanta. She had been missing since February 16, 1994, and was last seen at a classmate's home. Claudette had said she was leaving to visit her parents in Aiken, South Carolina. But two days later, Claudette's car was found abandoned in northwest Atlanta. Investigators would later find that Claudette's boyfriend, 23-year-old Jason Ragland, was the killer. The day she went missing, Claudette and Jason had planned to go to her parents to tell them she was four months pregnant. They got into an argument and Jason strangled Claudette. He retrieved anchors from a construction site near his workplace and dumped her body in a river. To avoid the death penalty, Jason pled guilty to Claudette's murder. He was sentenced to life in prison, and to this day, Jason claims he is innocent. After determining that Claudette's body was not Shannon's, the police had no leads. They continued to treat the case as a missing persons rather than a kidnapping, despite Shannon's parents consistently asserting that their daughter was in grave danger. On March 29th, two days after Shannon was reported missing, a man called the DeKalb County Police Department and said he kidnapped the missing girl at the gas station. He explained he was going to keep her until he was through with her. Despite that horrifying phone call indicating Shannon had been kidnapped, on March 30th, the police youth unit told the media that Shannon's case was being treated like any other missing persons report. They explained that they were approaching Shannon's case from two angles, that harm has come to her and foul play was involved, or she might be doing this to herself. The DeKalb County Police Department continued insinuating that Shannon had run away upset at her parents. In a public request for her daughter's return, Yvonne stated that Shannon could only be missing if she was abducted. She explained that Shannon was not a person to leave on a whim. Yvonne also appealed to the unknown kidnapper. She said, If the people who have my daughter now are looking or are letting her watch us, we want to say, please give her back and we love you, Shannon. Luis, Shannon's father, said, This is not a disappearing act. Shannon's car was found with the keys in it. That is totally out of character. On April 6, the Emory University Counseling Center received a phone call. The man on the phone sounded eerily similar to the person who called the DeKalb County Police Department on March 29th. The man said, I know you can trace this line. I have Shannon. She's okay. She's lonely. To prove I have Shannon, I'm going to tape her ring to the back of the phone. With the help of caller ID, the police tracked down the place where the man called from. It was a payphone by a Waffle House in Rex, Georgia. Near the phone, police found a blue topaz ring in a small cloth bag wrapped in masking tape. Shannon's godmother gave her that ring. The unknown man was telling the truth. He had Shannon. Corvin Cornelius Hinton III, known as Butch, was born on September 18, 1960. His father was Colvin Cornelius II, and he went by Cece. Not much is known about Butch Hinton's childhood years, but he already displayed violent behaviors in his teens. In 1977, Butch was 16 years old. He worked at Mr. D's Pizza in Kentucky. Butch and his brother went to his boss's home where Butch assaulted his boss's wife and ordered his brother to tie her up. The wife persuaded Butch to let her go by saying she wouldn't call the police. When Butch and his brother released her and left, the wife immediately called the police. Since Butch was a minor, he was only sentenced to counseling. After his conviction for assaulting his boss's wife, Butch's family left for Kentucky. They moved to Neponset, Illinois. At some point, Butch married a woman named Gail and began working as a butcher. Yes, you heard that right. Butch was a butcher. In 1982, Butch still lived in Indiana, where he continued his trend of terrorizing women. This time, it was 14-year-old Tammy Singleton. Tammy was Butch's little brother's ex-girlfriend. 
Butch lured Tammy to a cemetery under the pretense that his little brother would be there. When Tammy arrived, Butch tied her up, put a knife to her throat, abducted her, relocated her to his place, sexually fondled her, and kept her in his basement. When Butch's wife Gail arrived home, she heard Tammy screaming in the basement. Butch and Gail proceeded to take Tammy to their pastor. When questioned by the police, Butch admitted to tying up Tammy and locking her in his basement. Butch told the police that he didn't know what had happened. He said he'd never been this way before and that he suddenly had an instinct to go out and do bodily harm. Butch pleaded guilty but mentally ill to the charges of kidnapping and indecent liberties with a minor. He was sentenced to four years in prison. After serving two years, he was released on parole in June 1984. Sometime during this process, Butch and Gail divorced. Following his release from prison, Butch moved to Georgia, where his parole ended in 1986. While these two assaults were recorded in police records, it is likely Butch attacked more women. Steve Daniels, a reporter for NBC6, investigated Butch's past and criminal history. In Daniels' search, he found an additional victim. A member of Butch's extended family said he abducted her and repeatedly assaulted her. According to our research, Butch was never convicted of this assault. In March of 1994, the month that Shannon went missing, Butch lived in Rex, Georgia with his second wife, Michelle. He worked at Delta Airlines where he was a maintenance utility employee. Butch also worked part-time as an umpire at the Softball Country Club Sportplex on North Decatur Road in Atlanta. That's right, the same club where Shannon Melendi worked. Cut to April 6th. The police have tracked the phone call of a man who claims to have Shannon held hostage. The man called from a payphone in Rex, Virginia, the city where Butch lived. The small cloth bag used to hold Shannon's topaz ring is traced back to a manufacturer who said the only company they worked with in Georgia was Delta Airlines, the place where Butch worked. Delta Airlines also used the brand of masking tape found with Shannon's ring. Police also found small particles of metal debris on the masking tape. The debris was a combination of metal found only in environments involving jet engine maintenance and repair, such as a Delta Airlines facility. Approximately two weeks after Shannon's ring was discovered, Shannon's parents shared the development with the media. Police initially told them not to share the story for purposes of the investigation, but Luis and Yvonne were at their wit's end. Luis told reporters that the FBI said it was good news that he was letting us know she was alive and was okay. Yvonne said, we thought we would get another phone call. We were optimistic that she was alive, but it's more than two weeks and no call. In response to Luis and Yvonne's desperation, Florida Senators Bob Graham and Connie Mack wrote a letter to the U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno explaining Shannon's case. Almost immediately, an FBI task force was created to work with local police. This was when everything changed. Shannon's case wasn't a missing persons investigation anymore. It was now classified as a kidnapping. They replaced the posters and billboard that had explained Shannon was missing with ones that she was now kidnapped. Shannon's case was featured on The Oprah Winfrey Show, America's Most Wanted, and more. Finally, the case had momentum. But the FBI task force and other law enforcement had to make up for lost time. Because the DeKalb County Police Department had waited so long to take Shannon's disappearance seriously, many pieces of evidence were gone. Security tapes were erased. Shannon's car had been released to her roommate before it was searched for evidence. The FBI agent who took Shannon's topaz ring from the small cloth bag didn't wear gloves. The ominous calls by an unknown man who claimed to have had Shannon weren't recorded. To add insult to injury, no one was interviewed the weekend after Shannon's disappearance. It was Easter and, at that time, only a missing persons case. Also, police had focused their attention on the 1,000 people at the club that day instead of searching employee records. If they had, they would have seen that one of the employees working the same day as Shannon's disappearance was a convicted violent offender. 
when they finally spoke to Shannon's co-workers, police discovered several players had complained about the umpire working at the March 26 softball game. The player said that the umpire was distracted. He kept looking at and talking to the scorekeeper. One player explained that when they were throwing a pitch, the umpire would turn around to chat with the scorekeeper before the ball crossed the plate. The player said it was like he was obsessed with her. The scorekeeper was 19-year-old Shannon Melendi. The umpire was 34-year-old Butch Hinton. Law enforcement found that Butch was originally scheduled to work a full day on Saturday, March 26th. However, Butch called another umpire to cover the second half of his shift. He said he had a hot date. When the umpire couldn't cover his shift, Butch called his supervisor, knowing that a hot date was not a good excuse to leave work early. Butch changed his story. He told his supervisor that he needed to take care of a family member who had been beaten by her husband. But Butch's actual plans were far more sinister than the lies he told his colleagues. The day before, on March 25th, Butch learned that his wife was going to be out of town on the 26th. Butch called his wife's best friend. He asked to meet her on the afternoon of the 26th. He told the friend that it was important that she didn't tell anyone where she was going or who she was meeting. Butch lied and told the friend that his wife would be there. From these details, it's clear Butch planned to attack his wife's best friend, but she refused to meet with him. When he arrived at work, Butch met Shannon, and she became his new target. On the 26th, Butch left the club around 12.45 p.m. for his hot date. Five minutes later, Shannon went in the same direction as Butch. No one saw Shannon again. At 1.54 p.m., Butch began the process of establishing an alibi. He called his boss and said he could work more games that day, but Butch's boss said they didn't need him. Butch also called his wife, relatives, and friends. Between 2.30 and 3 o'clock p.m., Butch walked from the gas station to the club. At the club, he told a co-worker that he was getting ready to work a game, which the co-worker thought was odd, since he wasn't in his umpire uniform. Instead, he was wearing baggy, tiger-striped workout pants. Shortly after, the same worker saw Butch head to the clubhouse, clearly not working a game. At about 5 p.m., a different co-worker saw Butch. The co-worker thought Butch had left earlier, but Butch explained he had just returned. Butch claimed he had forgotten to turn in a payslip. The co-worker noticed that there was no payslip in Butch's hands. Then, Butch asked where his own car was. Around 3 a.m., a neighbor saw Butch tending to a bonfire in his yard. The next morning, he borrowed a bone saw from his dad. With this new trail of witnesses and confirmation that Butch was the last person to see Shannon alive, Butch was on law enforcement's radar as a potential suspect. On April 12th, police searched Butch's home and car. In Butch's home, there was no evidence of Shannon. Still, police discovered a slew of concerning items burned and buried in Butch's backyard. Various sizes of women's sweaters, skirts, and blouses, none of which belonged to Butch's wife, Michelle, or Shannon. There were also plastic pants worn at crime scenes and wire ties that could be used for binding wrists and ankles. Additionally, Nine rolls of the same masking tape found wrapped around the bag holding Shannon's topaz ring were found in Butch's home. After searching Butch's car, police found the same metal debris that was identified on masking tape. After searching Butch's house and car for hours, authorities told the media they didn't find anything suspicious in his home. Police also said that Butch was not a suspect, but they continued to search Butch's house six more times. Despite law enforcement's attempt to keep Butch calm by claiming he wasn't a suspect, Butch knew he was in trouble. He began taking precautionary measures. First, Butch asked his coworker at Delta Airlines to get him a pass card ticket to attempt to flee Georgia. Pass card tickets could only be used by employees wearing suits, but Butch didn't own a suit. He asked another coworker if he could borrow one. In the end, Butch's efforts didn't matter. The same night Butch planned to flee, the media publicly reported that he was possibly a suspect. Butch never returned to Delta Airlines, so he didn't receive the pass card or the suit. Unfortunately, 
the courts did not believe there was enough evidence to charge Butch with Shannon's murder. The lead prosecutor, John Petray, later explained, Hinton's background, his previous arrests, his history as being a sexual predator had come to light, but there was no body, no crime scene. No eyewitnesses could really put them together. They had been on the same softball field that day, but that was it. By June 1994, three months after Shannon's disappearance, her father, Louise, said that the FBI was no longer actively looking for Shannon. Luis was so distraught that he stopped working as a photographer. He was convinced Butch murdered Shannon, but the investigation was dwindling. There were no fresh leads. The case went from 12 full-time investigators to one. Chuck Johnson, the DeKalb County police spokesman, said authorities were no closer to solving Shannon's kidnapping. Chuck said, we need a break. Chuck's declaration was disheartening to those who cared about Shannon. By July, four months after Shannon's disappearance, Luis told the media that Captain Rodney Maddox of the DeKalb County Police called to explain his theory on Shannon's disappearance. Maddox asserted Shannon was abducted at the club, tied up in the woods, raped, murdered, and her body disposed of in the Yellow River. The river was near the club and searched many times. They never found any trace of Shannon's remains in the river. Louis said he was in hysterics when he heard Maddox's unsupported theory. While Maddox confirmed to the media that he spoke with Louise, Maddox wouldn't confirm the contents of this conversation. Maddox told the media, As time goes by, it's less likely that she's going to be alive. I think that's a very realistic statement, even if it's a difficult pill to swallow. On September 9th, 1994, Butch's house caught on fire. The house was severely damaged, especially the back. Butch filed an insurance claim. Law enforcement would come to believe Butch committed arson to rid himself of any remaining evidence of Shannon's murder. To this day, Butch says the fire was an accident. At this point, Shannon had been missing for six months. In late September, Luis, the FBI, and the local police all reported that the authorities believed Shannon to be dead. However, they each had a very different interpretation of when a suspect would be arrested. Louise said, The authorities feel that this case is solvable and in the next few weeks they might have an answer. FBI Special Agent Jerry Waring said there was new information that could lead to finding Shannon. DeKalb County Police Spokesman Chuck Johnson said, We are continuing to follow the leads that we have, but we are not a great deal further along than when she first disappeared. At this point, Neither the FBI nor the police would comment on if the fire at Butch's house was related to Shannon's disappearance. After quitting Delta Airlines and the club around the time when authorities searched his home and car, Butch lived his life as a free man for quite a while. He taught Sunday school at his church. He managed a McDonald's in College Park, Georgia. Life was practically normal. And as was normal for Butch, he continued to attack women. In December of 1994, Butch grabbed 19-year-old Della Cogburn's arm while she was walking home after a shift at McDonald's. He threatened her, saying, I've taken care of women before and wouldn't mind doing it again. Luckily, oncoming headlights spooked Butch. He let Della go and walked away. Della reported Butch and he was arrested on January 27, 1995 for false imprisonment. Charges were dismissed in February when Della didn't appear at the preliminary hearing. In June of 1995, Butch was indicted for burning down his house. The prosecution said Butch poured flammable liquid throughout his house, set it on fire, and collected $185,000 in insurance money. Butch claimed a faulty vacuum started the fire. Due to suspicions that Butch was attempting to cover up Shannon's murder, the arson case gained publicity in the Atlanta, Georgia area. The trial was moved to Panama City, Florida to avoid a biased jury. As a result of the arson trial, Butch was convicted of mail fraud and using fire to commit a felony in January 1996. Butch was sentenced to a maximum of 10 years in prison. In December of 2003, he was released after about eight years in prison. Police reinvigorated their efforts to convict Butch of Shannon's disappearance and murder. The lead prosecutor, John Petray, was certain Butch was the perpetrator. John called Shannon's father, Luis, to share his intentions. 
John later recalled the conversation, saying, I remember the conversation very well. I said, My name is John Petray. I'm a prosecutor in DeKalb County, Georgia, and I believe that we're going to be able to open a case on Butch Hinton for the murder of your daughter. And there was a long pause, and Louise said, I've been waiting for 10 years for this phone call, and that's when I knew I was going to do it. Using electron microscopes, investigators definitively tied Butch to Shannon's topaz ring. They confirmed the metal debris on the tape and bag around her ring was the same metal debris found in the Delta Airlines facility where Butch worked. They also matched it to metal debris in Butch's car. Butch also made a lot of incriminating statements to fellow inmates when he was serving time in prison for arson. One inmate found Butch screaming in the night. When Butch woke, he claimed he didn't kill the girl at the softball park, but the demon inside him did. Another inmate, Curtis, mentioned to Butch that he once knew a person who was convicted of murder without a body. Butch showed extreme interest in this conversation. He asked Curtis to show him how to research no-body cases in the law library. Later, Butch asked Curtis to sign an affidavit that they hadn't discussed Butch's case. Butch admitted to multiple inmates that he left items in Shannon's car after the murder and said that the police were stupid not to have searched it. Butch told one inmate that Shannon's body had been scattered to the wind and proceeded to describe the best way to dispose of a body. Cut it up crush the bones, and throw the pieces in a river. Butch bragged that he was a butcher so he could butcher a cow in as few as 30 minutes without getting blood on him. On multiple occasions, Butch told his fellow inmates that God forgives murder and that he would be forgiven no matter what he had done. On August 30th, 2004, 10 years after Shannon disappeared, Butch was finally indicted with malice murder and felony murder. He could not be charged with kidnapping because the statute of limitations had passed. Throughout the investigative process, Shannon's dad, Luis, was outspoken about his distaste for the justice system's treatment of Shannon's case. When Butch was arrested, Luis said that if the judge who had sentenced Butch to four years in prison for the attack on 14-year-old Tammy Singleton had given Butch a more severe sentence, Shannon would be alive today. Luis said, we are supposed to trust our lawmakers and judges, but some of them are not doing their jobs, period. Lead prosecutor John Petre expressed similar sentiments. John said, Butch Hinton is an extremely dangerous sexual predator. His ferociousness, his sexual appetite, it should have been apparent that this is not just a young man who slipped up. He was building up for bigger things. A year later, in August of 2005, Butch went to trial for Shannon's murder. Since there was no body, the prosecution didn't seek the death penalty. Just like Lord Matthew Hale suggested, the prosecution's priority was to prove a crime had been committed. Only then could they propose that Butch committed the crime. First, the prosecution established that Shannon did not run away. She was a generally happy woman. Shannon spoke to friends and family regularly. She had raved about her tan after her Florida spring break vacation. The prosecution openly admitted there was little physical evidence. However, the metal debris found on the masking tape with Shannon's ring at Butch's workplace and in Butch's car connected him to the crime. And the prosecution asserted that Butch's numerous confessions to his fellow inmates were key. The prosecution argued that on the day of Shannon's disappearance, Butch had originally planned to attack another woman, but those plans fell through. He focused then on Shannon. After kidnapping her, the prosecution claimed Butch returned to the club to establish an alibi. The next day, a neighbor saw Butch tending to a big bonfire in his backyard. The prosecution brought up the suspicious burned items in the backyard and Butch's criminal history of violence against women. When Butch's defense claimed that his criminal history wasn't relevant, the court determined that it demonstrated Butch's pattern of tricking women into vulnerable situations then restraining them for the purpose of sexual assault. Tammy Singleton, the 14-year-old girl Butch attacked in 1982, testified at trial. She said Butch had the Jekyll and Hyde element in his personality the night he abducted her. At first, he was nice. Then he'd show violent rage, then contrition, she said. I saw what I would describe as the presence of evil in his eyes. 
Butch asked Tammy to forgive him before he and his then-wife Gail freed her. Gail testified that when she freed Tammy, Butch was near catatonic. In closing arguments, the prosecution compared Butch Hinton to a demon. The defense claimed that the prosecution's evidence was not enough to convict Butch. They said, Mr. Hinton did some terrible things in the past, but it would be a huge jump to convict him of murder when there was no body, no blood, and no sign of violence at Butch's house. The defense claimed that the inmates were lying about Butch's confessions to get better sentences. They theorized that Shannon ran away or a different person kidnapped her. They accused Shannon of abusing drugs and alcohol as well as being promiscuous. Real original. Fortunately, the judge immediately stopped further remarks on Shannon's character and lifestyle. While the defense insinuated that Shannon may have run away due to stress from her tight budget, Shannon's friends countered that she was coping well. Shannon remained outgoing and friendly. Her friends said she wasn't stressed enough to run away. On September 19, 2005, after the jury deliberated for nine hours over the course of three days, Butch was found guilty for malice murder and felony murder. Butch remained emotionless when he heard the verdict. That same day, Butch was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. On the stand, Shannon's mother Yvonne spoke to Butch, saying, This is the first and last time I will ever speak to you. You murdered Shannon, but you did not kill her spirit. She will live on in our memories forever. She later told the media, I want him to spend a very long, miserable life in prison. That's where he belongs. It was the first no-body murder conviction in the state of Georgia. The prosecution attempted to increase Butch's sentence to life without parole, but it wasn't legal then. Later, Butch appealed his conviction, but on July 17, 2006, the Supreme Court of Georgia denied it. Immediately following the denial, Butch spoke to his father about what happened to Shannon. Then, Butch reached out to the local police department. Butch said, I can't live like this no more. If I have to stay in a cell for 23 hours a day for the rest of my life, at least I can breathe. She can't. The prison that I am in is no comparison to the prison inside of me. The time had finally come. Butch had confessed. ABC News reported the confession. Butch's confession confirmed most of the story prosecutors had put together for the trial. Butch admitted he planned to rape his wife's best friend on March 26, but she refused to meet up with him. After meeting Shannon for the first time at the softball game, Butch invited her to lunch. Shannon accepted. They ate at Burger King, and as they were driving his car back to the club, Butch faked a wrong turn. He pulled onto a highway and towards his home in Rex, Georgia. Then he pretended to have a leg cramp and convinced Shannon to drive. When Butch climbed in the back seat, he pulled out a knife he'd hidden in the floorboard and held it to Shannon. Butch forced her to drive to his house. Shannon asked, What are you doing? Butch replied, Don't argue, just drive. Once at Butch's place, he bound Shannon in his guest room. He convinced her he only wanted to steal her car. He'd released her when he sold it. Butch made phone calls to establish an alibi, leaving Shannon tied up. Butch returned to the club and drove Shannon's car to a gas station. He left the car unlocked with the keys in the ignition, hoping someone would steal the car and throw the police off track. Butch went back home, untied Shannon, and raped her. He tied her back up, this time face down on the floor. Throughout the entire endeavor, Butch said Shannon was calm and cooperative. She never lost control of her emotions. Butch said she didn't ever try to scratch, no hitting. Butch reassured Shannon repeatedly that he would let her go once he sold her car, but that was never his intention. Butch left Shannon bound to the floor of his guest bedroom while he went to see the Mighty Ducks in theater with his niece, nephew, and their parents. He returned home around 10.30 p.m. Shannon was where he had left her. He raped her a second time and then panicked. He didn't know what he was going to do with Shannon. After some time, he went to bed. At 2 a.m., Butch got up. He saw Shannon laying on the guest room floor. Butch said that he stood there staring thinking about how he was going to take her life. Then, Butch grabbed a necktie off the tie rack in his room. 
According to Butch, she had no idea he was there. He suspected she was asleep. Butch said, I came over on top of her real quick. I took the tie and put it around her neck. I think I crossed it and strangled her right there. She stopped moving. It happened a lot quicker than I ever thought. For the next hour and a half, Butch paced as he considered Shannon's lifeless body. Initially, he was concerned she was only unconscious, but her body became cold and pale. He eventually moved her body to a rollaway dumpster on the side of his house. Later on, he put Shannon's body on a bed of logs and brush and set it on fire with gas. At 7 a.m., Butch called his dad. Butch told his dad that a tree fell on his car, so he needed to borrow his bow saw. His dad offered to bring the bow saw over, but Butch insisted on picking it up himself. When Butch returned, he claimed that Shannon's body was completely incinerated by the bonfire. It's unclear if this is true. According to Officer.com, a wood fire would not get hot enough to burn the bones of a body. During the cremation process, which is significantly hotter than a wood fire, larger fragments of bones still have to be ground up. After retrieving his dad's bow saw, Butch dressed and went to church. At 2 p.m., Butch's wife, Michelle, got home. He was concerned she'd asked about his weekend, so he distracted her by taking her to dinner at Olive Garden. Then, Butch gave her one of the two rings he had stolen off Shannon's fingers. He told his wife he had bought the ring from a friend who had recently separated from his fiance. The second ring he stole was a blue topaz ring found in a cloth bag bound with masking tape. Around 11 p.m. that night, Butch was paranoid police were coming to search his house. He got up and cleaned Shannon's ashes from the bonfire, telling Michelle he had to prepare the yard for the landscaper the next day. Michelle's role in all of this is really unclear. 11 o'clock at night is an odd time to clean your yard for the landscaper, and Michelle held the bag as Butch poured in Shannon's ashes from the bonfire. So did Butch grind up Shannon's unburned bones, or did Michelle ignore them? Butch claims Michelle had no idea they were Shannon's ashes. He took the bag of ashes to a ditch near some railroad tracks in Rex, Georgia, and dumped them. After finding out what Butch confessed to, Shannon's father, Luis, told ABC News he was skeptical that there was more to the story. Luis said, He is a more professional criminal than the police are professional policemen. He killed her and burned her body in the backyard. The police were out there and they could not find a trace of my daughter. I don't believe that. Today, Butch Hinton is incarcerated in Hayes State Prison in Chattooga County, Georgia. In 2011, 51-year-old Butch wrote a letter to an unknown person outside of the prison that says, I committed a murder in 1994. For 12 years, I lied and manipulated so many people into believing I was truly an innocent man who was being falsely accused of murder. But in July of 2006, the weight of my guilty conscience was too much to bear and I confessed and admitted my guilt. I then lost my family and all my friends due to the hurt and pain I caused them by my deceit. I now must reap the consequences of my actions from that day. Since Georgia law did not allow Butch to be imprisoned without parole, he becomes eligible for parole approximately every eight years. He was denied parole in 2012 and again in 2020. Each time Butch becomes eligible, the Melindy family is forced to go before the board and fight for Butch to remain in prison. Shannon's mother Yvonne said, Butch has a sliver of hope that he'll be released someday. It's very difficult for us to move on. We have to bring our guts up all over again and lay them out, and it hurts. Luis expressed his anger at Butch's continual opportunities for parole by saying, if they let him out and he kills someone else, it's on them, not us. The next time Butch is eligible for parole, Luis and Yvonne will be in their 80s. Luis expressed concern that Butch will still be eligible for parole when they have passed, and that Shannon's little sister, Monique, will have to deal with this animal alone. Monique has said, It's a huge weight on us. In my heart, I don't believe that he'll get out, but I have to continue fighting to make sure that doesn't happen. Butch will be eligible for parole again around 2028. There is a change.org petition available to express support for Butch's continued incarceration. We'll include the link in our show notes. Following Shannon's death, a street near her alma mater, Southwest Miami Senior High School, was renamed Shannon Melendi Drive. The decision to rename the street was unanimous. 
The high school also retired Shannon's soccer jersey, which was number 19. Sadly, Yvonne passed away on May 19, 2021. Yvonne once described her daughter by saying, Shannon tried to show people that there are not just weeds on the side of the road, that there are flowers that grow in between, and they are really pretty. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a positive review and rating on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. It really does help. You can find us on most social media channels, Twitter at truecrime underscore cases, facebook.com slash TCFC podcast and Instagram at True Crime Cases with Lainey. And of course, our website is truecrimecasespodcast.com. If you have an episode request, send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was researched by Haley Gray and written by Andrea Marshbank. Content editing by Brittany Martinez. Produced by Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check them out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkofDreams.com. Production assisted by Jesse Hogg.